my pet project right now that I've been focusing on uh, is developing an RV park. Um, so that's kind of my my next step. So that's um, that's been a fun journey. I love uh, I love learning new stuff. Um, so it's a lot. you're listening to the Real Fi Podcast, where we discuss time tested tricks, techniques, and strategies for pursuing financial independence today. So that we can enjoy a better tomorrow. A better tomorrow. Financial independence isn't about getting rich quick. It's about cultivating a foundation to grow financially, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Let's figure out how to kick the nine to five. Here are your hosts, Patrick and James. How's it going, everybody? And welcome back to the Real FI Podcast. I'm James Ripion, and I'm here with Patrick McGrath. And we hope you guys enjoy this episode. We have the distinct pleasure of bringing to you the best guest we've had on this podcast so far. Um, you know, truth be told, he's our first guest, but I think we're going to knock it out of the park with this one anyways. How's it going, Nate? Good to see you. Hey, good, uh, good to see you guys too. Thanks for having me. So this is Nate Dobbins. Uh, we um, have a funny history um, of actually getting to know each other. I'll let Patrick get into that, but uh, it's good to have you on the podcast. Yeah, so I've actually known Nate for quite a few years now. I don't know, at least eight or nine if we go back in time. Uh, yeah, for sure. When I was an outside sales rep at Granger. But the three of us actually all met, I think it was last October. We went to a syndication meetup at 8 a.m. in, I think it was Reston, Virginia. So all of us were really trying to shoot for our goals <laughs> goals then and uh, kind of all linked up and a year later here we are I mean this is a uh, pretty exciting stuff yep absolutely yes yeah, uh, I was super excited to see you guys have teamed up and we're doing this so I'm happy to be here for sure the, the crazy part is is that Nate is the one that uh that reached out to me and brought that event to uh to me so that's that's uh that's really funny and that's kind of how I got in touch with James and then after that uh, going to the Frederick meetup. So here we are a year later on our journey, all getting together now. So pretty hey, interesting. You're, you're, you're based in Northern Virginia, right? Yeah. So I live in uh, Gold Vein, Virginia. So just outside of Fredericksburg, about an hour south of DC. Uh, so, and I, I typically operate in this area. I grew up here, kind of know it. So kind of stick around here for my, for my wholesaling piece. Gotcha. Sounds good. Yeah. I got a, I think I was traveling down from Frederick, Maryland. I think it was in Bethesda that the syndication thing was. Um, but it's, you know, it's pretty cool that we were all able to come from at least two hours away from each other to come meet and converge in this one area. Yeah, Ola Dantas ran that ran that meetup there. Uh, super awesome guy. He actually worked with me at uh, Spectera when Patrick was the uh, the Granger sales rep coming around there. So it was real, real funny that he, you know, he was doing that too. He was flipping houses and townhomes and stuff in, in Baltimore when he was still working there. So he started he started before we did. Wow. That's uh that's pretty interesting. Well, Nate, it goes, uh, so why don't you tell us just a little bit about your background, kind of, you know, what's your story, where are you headed? Give us a little bit of uh, insight into, uh, into Nate Dobbins. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Um, so I, uh, out of college, I, uh, I did two years at Virginia Tech. I uh, didn't really like my major. I uh, decided to take some time off and focus on my Marine Corps career. Uh, so I was in the Marine Corps. I did eight years in the Marine Corps as a heavy equipment mechanic. Uh, worked on construction equipment. It was super fun. I enjoyed that. Like like tinkering with stuff and fixing things and figuring problems out. So I was suited for it pretty well. I uh, did a deployment to uh, Afghanistan. Got back. Uh, hit my reserve time after that. And then I ended up getting out. Um, Got a job at Spectera, like we were just talking about, right, as a maintenance supervisor. Um, so between that and uh, another ma uh, manufacturing job, I spent about five years in manufacturing, uh, ended as a uh, plant manager out in uh, Hagerstown, Maryland. Um, I was actually uh, terminated from that job. You know, it sounds uh, sounds weird to, to laugh when I say that now, but probably one of the best things that's ever happened to me, you know, kind of set me on the path to actually doing what I feel like I, I need to be doing, right, which is being home and, and doing real estate, uh, which I which I love the, the flexibility that's given me now. But um, yeah, so started doing real estate. Actually, right after I got terminated, uh, we have we're having our uh, second child getting ready to bring them in. And uh, I started went to go back to school. 
And so I went to uh, uh, UMUC online college, uh, finished my uh, degree in computer networking and cybersecurity. <laughs> uh, so I figured, you know, former veteran, uh, it's a good skill to have around the DC area. I did uh, 82, applied for 82 jobs, got one phone interview. Um, so I was like, well, this apparently isn't going to be for me. So I decided wow. to do uh, real estate full time. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of how it got me here. Uh, so I'm the stay-at-home dad to our three kids. They're seven, five, and three right now. Uh, so I run them around all their stuff and, and whatnot, keep them alive. <laughs> That's the, the main goal of the stay-at-home <laughs> parent, right? <laughs> exactly. And, um, yeah. And so for real estate stuff, I started with uh, wholesaling um, vacant land. I, was, I had a couple of things, you know, I was listening to um, some podcasts. There's, there was always that shiny object thing, but I, I landed on uh, wholesaling vacant land. You know, the Wholesaling houses, it's super crowded market for that, uh, especially in this area. HGTV TV makes that super popular. Flipping, you know, they make that super popular. And so there weren't a lot of people wholesaling vacant land. And I kind of knew a little bit about land, so it seemed to fit. So I'd start doing that. What were some of the other things that you were exploring before you got into vacant land? Uh, did you, yeah. you know, tinker with any other ideas? Yeah, so the typical stuff, right? The, the flipping. Um, that uh, I, I was a licensed contractor back in high school for a few years. Uh, I'm a class C in Virginia. Um, so a new construction, that piece didn't scare me. Uh, but like I said, the, the market was just super saturated with wholesalers. Um, and with the prices rising at the time, they're not, not as crazy as they are now uh, price wise, but with the prices going up, it's just hard to, hard to find a deal. Um, and, you know, flipping the margins can be a little tight on that too. So with that, not starting with a lot of capital, you know, I figured I'd just go something a little more basic and easier and less uh, less competitive with the land. So now, how, were you how did doing... you come across vacant land? How, how did you land on that one? Was it a podcast you were listening to, or yeah? So I heard a couple podcasts, um, and uh, there's a few um, there's a few websites too about folks out there, Facebook groups and stuff. So I was at that time I was just uh, being a huge uh, information gathering uh, journey, right? So I'm listening to podcasts and trying to trying to read some books every now and then and talk to folks and Facebook groups and everything, you know, and a couple people were talking about that and just started looking into it and just a lot less stuff you typically have to worry about, uh, you know, as, as compared to houses, right? There's no pest inspection and nothing like that. You don't have to worry about rotting floors, you know, really the only thing you got to worry about is water and sewer um, and then zoning. So it's uh, it's pretty simple compared to houses. Now um, with, with, land wholesaling are you kind of doing the same thing as a regular wholesaler where are you sending out mailers to people that own these lots are you making phone calls doing text message blasts you know tell us a little bit about that i'm, I'm fairly intrigued on on how that all works yeah great question yeah so the the process is basically the same so uh, i started out using a program called real flow um i'm sure people have heard about that it's a, you know aggregates public data uh, into one stop shopping where you can kind of search properties through like Zillow. Um, I used that for a little while. I wasn't crazy about it. I tried out PropStream after that. Um, and I've just, I love that. It was, uh, seems super intuitive to me. I like the organization. Um, and so I've been using that. So I'll, I'll search counties. Um, I'll search vacant land. I typically will filter it out down to owners that um, their mailing address is a different zip code than the property. Uh, in the hopes that, you know, either they don't see or care or know about the property as often. Um, it kind of narrows down my, my targeting as well. And then in PropStream, I can go ahead and market directly to those folks. And I use uh, postcards. So you can do custom postcards with whatever verbiage you want on them, picture, that kind of stuff. They have two different sizes, um, but it's super simple, you know, right out of the, right out of the program there, right from the list I just filtered. Uh, and then I also hired a call center. Uh, I was uh, being a stay-at-home dad to three kids. You know, it's not always advantageous to have a, a seller call me when my two kids are screaming in the background, you know, or I'm trying to make them lunch or whatever. So I hired a call center and um, they take all the calls from the postcards. And then I get emails sent to me with the, the seller's info and I work it down from there. So I'm, I'm sure you got a lot of data on what it takes to generate a lead uh, using this whole process of, you know, acquiring interested seller uh hiring the the call center do you have do you have an average cost of what it takes as far as marketing and 
overhead uh, for you to kind um, of get deal flow? Yeah, so the, the I'm a one man uh, one man show right now. Uh, you know, outside of the call center that I've hired, um, so I don't I don't have the numbers on like my my time and overhead and that kind of deal. But the postcards is super cheap. Prop stream is hundred bucks a month. Uh, very reasonable for the amount of data you get for that and what that can do for you. And um, you know, especially with them it automating the automating the postcards being sent out, managing all the seller data and everything like that. Um, super super worth it for something like that but um i'm at uh the postcards I'm, it's probably maybe a, maybe a dollar something like that per lead that i'm I'm spending um if you want to factor in a little bit of my time prop stream and then the cost of the postcards postcard cost uh varies depending on how many i send out in a in the mailing uh so you know you get price break the more you send out right uh, mm -hmm. but yeah it's probably probably about a dollar per uh per lead and then Pre-COVID or early COVID, I was about a one and a half to two percent rate of return on those, um, which uh, which is decent uh, if you know anything right about uh, direct mail. It's not a bad return. Um, but recently, you know, last six eight months, uh, it's been pretty abysmal uh, with the rate of return on there. Uh, I think really? I think sellers are seeing the uh, the retail market. You know, they're seeing the high prices and people are talking about that. And I just I don't think people aren't wanting to let their properties go for something I can make a, make a deal out of. So. Yeah. I, I sent a whole bunch of letters out for small multifamilies in Hagerstown area in, in Maryland. And this was probably right before COVID got started, uh, October, November, and we're getting incredible, maybe 5% response rates. So it was, it was really successful. Um, and then we started doing some more, and I've, you know, didn't do it super uh, regimented system by any means. So it was just kind of whenever I felt like sending these things out. But as yeah. COVID kind of progressed and, you know, the property prices started rising, we really had response rates just eliminated and it became super yeah. difficult for us. Are, are you doing anything to kind of anything new to kind of navigate that new market? Or are you just kind of hammering down and you know, pressing forward and keeping with the systems that have, have shown to work? Um, that's, that's a great question. Yeah. So a few months ago, um, I engaged a digital marketing company. So I, I did have some Google ads running. Um, I also um, advertising in a smaller magazine um, down here in the Stafford area uh, that hits um, some higher net worth individuals uh, in that, in the County. Um, but honestly the direct mail has always been my best uh rate of return i actually just stopped my my google ads i was tracking that for the last three months and i got uh zero zero uh calls in my call center from that um and, and i i do a, a pretty niche thing it's not it's not homes right a lot of people look at look at home stuff but vacant land's kind of it's kind of weird it's different um so i just wasn't getting a getting a return on that but yeah so i'm just i'm sticking with the the postcard direct mail and then Word of mouth, right? So I run a I run a meetup for investors. We meet once a month. I'm part of the uh, Ferrisburg Area Builders Association, so I network with builders all the time because that's typically who I'm trying to sell my lots to. Um, they're my they're my goal and buyer. Um, so I get I get some deals come through that way sometimes. So do you find that? A lot of these people that own these lots are a little older. I'm, um, you know, for me, I kind of. I kind of assume that there's probably a family or an older uh, couple or someone like that who would probably have this large plot of land that could be subdivided or has a lot that they're not using. Is that typically who you're getting these responses from? For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, the older folks that, you know, they're, they either want to get their estate in order and ready for their, for their kids to pass that on. And they just want, they just want cash. They don't want to have to worry about their kids dealing with the land and trying to subdivide it or whatever um i've had multiple ones where it's a uh uh an elderly woman or, or man and their spouse has passed on and their spouse is the one that had the lot and they just never did anything with it and so they just want to get rid of it so it's definitely an older demographic 40 40 plus uh from my data so and, and how about the property demographics like how what size lot are you looking at or is there specific i know you said buildable you know because those are some of your buyers but are you looking at 
all types of zone property that are you just looking at everything or is there like an ideal parcel that kind of fits the mold that you try to target? Yeah. So the ideal one that I, that I like to work with um, and I, I don't get, there's no filter for zoning in, in prop stream. Um, I can target specific areas if I know the, the zoning, but typically I just, I blanket a County um, and I'll see what, see what hits. But typically what I, what I look for is something that's residentially zoned or agriculturally zoned. Uh, and I know in each of the counties, how we can subdivide that. That way I can pitch it to the builders that I know that work in that area. Uh, commercial stuff I don't typically work with. That's um, to commercial land is a different animal. Uh, it's kind of hard to value and uh, you kind of, you have to hold on to that a lot longer. Uh, I just don't have a great, I don't have a great commercial buyer list. Um, and it's, like I said, you gotta got hold on to that longer than a typical residential lot. Well, I can definitely so. see that being true. You don't see as many commercial buildings going up, especially where I'm yeah. at these days as compared to the residential new construction. I mean, they're throwing yeah. up subdivisions everywhere these days. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, I'm sure everyone's asking the question out there. So what are, what are these vacant lots going for? I mean, what kind of uh, return on your investment um, are you, are you getting out of this towards your goals? Yeah. So each one's different, right? So, I mean, I've had some that, uh, you know, I'm making a wholesale fee of, uh, as little as two grand. Um, some of them I partnered on, you know, and they're at the lower end there. And I've, I've got some that are 12 grand that I've made on them. And then I've got one, I'll look at bigger parcels every now and then there's one that I just did a, um, it's kind of interesting. I, I put a, uh, an option agreement offer, um, uh, on a lot. It was 275 acres. Um, but, uh, that could have been, a that could have been a six figure wholesale uh, fee for me. So it just really, really just depends on the deal that comes across, but the typical ones, right. The residential lots, you know, I'm looking at anywhere between two, five, seven grand uh, per buildable lot that I'm getting. Wow. Now, so do you see this um, wholesale business that you've been working on as a stay at home dad over the last, I guess, year, year and a half um, as being your way to get towards that, that financial independence, or are you already there with that? Like, you know, kind of, kind of break that down for us on, you know, what you're trying to get out of it and really what financial independence, you know, means to you with this business. Sure. That's a great question. Yeah. So the wholesaling piece for me is really the, the first kind of stepping stone. Um, I, I love the niche. It's great. Um, it's just not super sustainable. It's not uh, consistent. Uh, and I, I, I want to be having cash flow uh, that I'm not having to actively go out and get, you know, those wholesale deals. That's, that's the, this is one of the more difficult things I feel like in, in real estate, right? Getting, getting those leads, getting the seller to sign a contract. Um, so eventually I want to, I'm, I'll probably keep, keep doing it. Right. Cause I'm, I'm getting the name for it. I know, I know the numbers and the area and stuff. Um, but my main goal is to move on to a more cash flow based asset. So my pet project right now that I've been focusing on, uh, is developing an RV park. Um, that's kind of my my next step so that's um that's been a fun journey i love uh i love learning new stuff um so it's a lot of fun learning about the industry and the campgrounds and everything i joined the national association of rv and campground owners uh, a few months ago so i've been pouring over all the data that they pull from their owners uh their all their members right the campground owners and so that's been really cool to see the different different areas in the country how they're doing how they're going through covid um, I've done a couple of workshops with them. I'm going to the annual conference in November. Um, and right now I'm, I'm working through, uh, I started with 35. I'm down to 20 lots that I've uh, picked out across Virginia right now that I'm vetting uh, to see if they'd be good for an RV park ride. So I'm looking at what kind of amenities are around, what's the location. Uh, and then really the biggest thing, uh, right, is talking to the planning and zoning and saying, hey, you know, is this going to work? What are your regulations around it? And then I'm asking them about the board of supervisors, right? Are they going to approve my special use permit to put an RV park in? Because there are counties out there that just think you're going to put a mobile home park in, or like there's a county I talked to um, on uh, Monday, they're in litigation with two out of three campgrounds in their county. So they are not amenable at all to a new one coming in. So those are great things to know. That way I'm not wasting time on those lots and 
trying to fight an uphill battle. You know, I want, I want to go in somewhere where, you know, the community is going to be okay with us being there, you know, and partner with us and help. Yeah. I was going to ask if you were taking the strategy of just buying the lot first that you thought would work well and trying to get it approved with the special variants or the exceptions or that whole process, or if you were just going to do all your due diligence up front and be as certain as you could, could be before actually moving forward. Cause I'm sure that things might change based off what some uh, government, you know, employed person might tell you one thing and then someone else comes in and maybe they tell you another thing. Um, so how are you kind of balancing doing the amount of due diligence you need to do to feel comfortable and being able to just jump on the deal that looks like a great opportunity? Yeah, so the uh, most of the stuff that I'm uh, lots I'm looking at, I'm, I'm okay paying uh, market prices for it. I, I kind of have that factored into my projections. Um, and, and so I'm not as worried about, you know, finding a, a deal, uh, you know, per se, like I don't need to get anything like 50% market rate, you know. Um, and so I'm, I'm definitely more focused on really that board of supervisors, right? Or whoever is approving in that county, whoever's approving my special use permit uh, for the RV park. Outside of that, there's not a whole lot of regulations around new build RV parks, right? Because think about it. Most of the ones in the country are built in the 70s and the 80s. And um, people just haven't, multiple counties I've been talking to, they just haven't had anyone build a new one in the county in, in decades. Um, and so there's a federal standard, uh, the NFPA 11, right, which kind of dictates how you should lay out your, your campground and all your fire protection and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's a it's huge manual, um, but has all the great info in there. So that's kind of the federal document that a lot of the guys use, um, a lot of the folks use with their, if they are developing a new one. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's really just who's going to, who's going to approve that special use permit. So, so when you're, when you're looking at this RV park, right, you're going to have your nightly lot rent, um, is where your cash flow is going to come in, maybe a, a shop for everything that everybody forgets. But really, it come, you're, you're really looking at electric at each camp site, um, your lighting, um, a bathhouse, and really the road, the roads to and from a playground. I mean, um, less than less than a, a mobile home park because you're not having public water really running to each each lot or anything like that. I mean, tell us a little bit about what um, what what type of income you can generate and what size kind of RV park are we talking here? 50 lots, 100, 200. And, you know, what that's going to mean to you and your family if you can develop something like this. Sure, absolutely. So, um I'll start with, so the number, number of lots that I'm looking at doing, I, I like to do uh, 125 lots. Um, and so I've talked to, there are two consultants, right? Guys that have owned campgrounds for 40 years. Um, now they consult the people, help them build the, the RV park and they're, they're tapped into a bunch of owners. And so they, they have insights on what works, what doesn't, contractors, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so talking with those folks, right? If you're, if you're looking at doing a decent RV park, Typically, your costs are going to be somewhere between 30 and 50 grand per site, um, depending on how nice you want to make it, you know, material costs, contract costs, that kind of stuff in your area. Um, and then that's all encompassing, right? So playground, pool, bathhouse, shop, sites, roads, all that, except for the land purchase, right? Because that varies so much. And but so that 30 to 50 grand is a good rough number to start with your projections on that. Um, and then I, will, I am planning on doing full hookups right, for each site. So that means water, uh, 30 amp, and then 50 amp electric, uh, and then sewer hookups um, at each site. The, uh, wow. Like I was speaking earlier, right? So a lot of the campgrounds built in the 70s and 80s, right? They, they didn't have uh, 35, 40, 45 foot class A RVs back then. Um, there, there's just not a lot of campgrounds that kind of cater to them. And so I kind of want to, uh, I want to go max on my, on my target, right? My, my ability to, to house them. Uh, and so that's kind of who I'm targeting those, those higher end ones, make sure my roads can handle them, make sure the sites can handle them, all that kind of stuff. And, and most of those, they want, they want full hookups. And so that's what I'm going to be, I'm going to be doing there. Um, as far as income, um, <laughs> it can vary based on your, your amenities and location, that kind of stuff. Um, when I'm looking at the data uh, from the National Association 
right, of uh, RV and campground owners. The average for the Northeast, based on 23% of owners polled last year, uh, was about $60 a night, uh, $55 a night with a 60% occupancy rate. Um, and so my projections, so when you talk about investments, right, um, since we're talking about real estate investing, cash on cash uh, return, right, is something that a lot of folks look at. They use that to compare asset classes uh, to each other, um, cash, cash turn, IRR, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call that. Um, I've looked at apartment syndicating and all kinds of flipping and all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, the, the, the RV park has some great, great cash on cash returns, right? So at those numbers, 125 sites, um, the, that average occupancy number, right? And the, the basic expenses and everything that I've um, been able to, to lay out roughly talking to folks and everything, um, you know, at hundred percent ownership, right? If I, if I get the down payment and I own it, I'm looking at like a 41, 42% cash on cash return, uh, after expenses, after 10% for CapEx, 10% for maintenance and 20% for taxes taken out. So that's a 41% cash on cash return on my net net. That's incredible. And I, I have to imagine that a huge component of being able to get cash flow like that is how niche this market is. I've honestly really never heard of anybody trying to develop RV parks. So I, there's got to be a barrier to entry for anybody who's kind of considering this. You hear about like mobile home parks, which conceptually are a little similar. And I, I guess self-storage, I guess, might be the second most similar type of real estate, but RV parks are just super, super unique. Do you, do you own an RV? Is, is that something that might have kind of spurred the interest in this particular asset class? I, I don't own an RV. No, I've been camping. I love camping. I love the outdoors, right? hence my office tonight. Um, but no, I don't own one. Um, I, you know, I came across it, you know, like I said, talking to folks in my investment groups and doing research. I was already doing land. Um, I started looking at sales data, um, you know, because I knew some folks that had RVs. I started looking at sales data. The last three years, they've had the, the best sales ever for RVs, ever. Exactly. And especially with COVID. Yeah. COVID, you know, that's, that's pushing people out. And it's also bringing on this new advent of more people being able to work from home. So if you have decent internet, people are full-time RVing and they're, they're seeing the country and that's what they're doing. Uh, so it's pushing more people out. And you look at the demographics too, right? So the two largest groups of people in America that are, that are RVing and love camping, and this is pre-COVID, um, you know, COVID's just kind of a, extended that, right? Pushed that into a larger group, but you have baby boomers and you have millennials, two largest demographics in America. They're the top two groups that are out there RVing. And so they'll be here for decades. Well, you're definitely thinking ahead. So that's very valuable. As we kind of look to wrap it up a little bit, are there any books that really shaped your FI journey and helped motivate positive thinking behind, you know, your desire to become financially independent and pursue monetary freedom? Podcast, books, resources, people. Yeah, so I'm a, uh, with the kids and everything, I'm typically an auditory learner. Uh, so podcasts for me, Bigger Pockets podcast is probably the biggest one. Um, there's not too many RV podcasts out there. They're growing. There's some YouTube channels, but uh, really the biggest, bigger pockets podcast, really the one that kind of uh, charged me up in the beginning, you know, got me, got me really going at it. Um, they're just a wealth. I know both, you know, this, right. There's a, a wealth of knowledge. And, uh, it's great. Great atmosphere there. Great podcast. So, but yeah. So the RV park um, that's getting you on this journey, do you, do you feel like if you're able to, you know, develop this just one RV park. Is that going? To, is that going to get you to your goals of of financial independence? And kind of what does that really look like? You know, for you and your family. Sure. Yeah. So that's um, and a lot of things that I do, I realize I'm kind of um, I'm kind of tiered in my mind, right? So there's steps. I, I typically don't have uh, just one goal, right? That I'm I'm working toward towards the end. There's there's typically I start, you know, I start with the one and then that leads to the others. Right. Um, so this would be, that would be, if we got that first year, right. And that's, it's developed when we get the first year and it's developed and it's done. And we get that at the end of the year and we hit those average numbers or better, or even for close. Right. Uh, that's absolutely going to change, um, 
you know, that's going to be our, the first big change for the family. Um, my wife would be able to stop working if she wanted to, um, you know, and be more involved with the kids and I'd be able to do more full-time real estate stuff and, you know, just keep pushing that real estate envelope and seeing what I want to get into next. That's amazing. That's amazing. All right. Well, you know, we got a couple more minutes here. So take us on the next three year, the next three years of that. So this one RV park, that's going to change your immediate, immediate life, you know, yep, but yep. what, what's that three year goal look like uh, for you and your, in your uh, financial independent journey? Um, yeah, I'd say so three years, um, you know, obviously the, my goal is uh, the next year and a half to have the development either done or um, almost done on that park. Uh, you know, if I'm not already like six months into having bookings. Um, so a year and a half after that, you know, we've got that uh, proofed out. Um, and we'll probably be looking at uh, refinancing that point, depending on what the financing looks for this deal. But yeah, it's uh, either probably looking for another, probably looking at doing another RV park, honestly. Um, it's a great model. It's needed. Uh, there's only, last time I looked at the data about a month and a half ago, there were only eight parks uh, in Virginia that meet NFPA 11 standards and can fit up to the, the, the larger class A's um, like safely, right? So there's there's definitely a need for it. RV storage is another thing um, that would probably be at that brink, right? When I have the capital to do that, um, tons of demand for RV storage. You know, there's HOAs out there that won't allow you to park them in your driveway or on the street. And, uh, you know, especially covered electric storage, people are paying 150, 200, 250 a month just to park their RV there, uh, especially if it's covered in electric, you probably get more than that. Uh, that's kind of a cool loophole too, depending on where you can get the land. Your RVs are taxed um, by where they're stored, not by your primary residence. And there are some counties that, uh, like Prince William County in Virginia, they don't have any uh, personal property tax for RVs. And so if you got land, if I got land there, you could make that your like headlining marketing uh, uh, stick, right? You you park your RV here, you're not paying any personal property tax on it. So I've definitely looked into that. I think that's such an awesome way to generate cash flow. Um, Cause I definitely know that there's a need. My father has two RVs. Luckily he lives on five acres. So he's got plenty of room to keep them out there, but it's not covered. Yeah. Um, and he, he's always telling me how people will pay up to 200 bucks a month just to store a vehicle outside covered with a little drip of electricity coming into it every now and then to keep the battery tendered. Um, I yep. think that's a credible idea. I think when I did look into it, though, that, and this is where I'm not informed enough, is the zoning requirements for being able to store vehicles. Um, so that's something I think I'd probably have to look into. But I've definitely looked at properties here in North Carolina for that purpose. Because um, yep. I, I acknowledge there's a huge demand for that. It's and so you, don't need a, you don't need a lot either, right? I mean, you, you look at an acre. Um, and I haven't had an engineer do any of the work or anything, which based on, based on like basic monkey math, right. You could probably get like 80, uh, 80 spots, right. In an acre pull through to fit the 45 footers, uh, cover an electric. And you're talking about, uh, 16, you know, 16 a month. grand a month. Like that's crazy. That's amazing. Well, for, you know what, Nate, this is, this is extremely interesting because I actually was just talking with two of my, two of my buddies and we were talking about developing an RV park probably about two or three months ago. And yeah. uh, this conversation has been extremely informative to me. Um, and now that we've had this conversation, I'm sure I'll be reaching out with, with many more questions. And I'm 100% positive that uh, James and I are going to be asking you to come back and tell us about the updates um, and how it's going uh, when we have a little bit more time. Um, for sure. Extremely, extremely in interesting conversation. And uh, we can tell that you've done your research. You know exactly what you're talking about, where you want to be, where you're going. Um, so that's extremely exciting. So for anybody out there that wants to get in contact with you, that has any questions, you know, that wants to pick your ear about land or this RV park development or, or anything like that, what's your website? Where can, where can everybody find you? um let everybody know yeah so i'm on facebook and instagram as under uh, dobbins realty you can message me there um and i'm i'm an open book i'm happy to happy to talk about real estate i love real estate love love helping people achieve their uh, financial freedom goals and time freedom goals like that's the 
that's the real goal, right? Time freedom, right? You want to be able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. Um, and if you can improve people's lives and offer a great product along the way, that's, that's a bonus. So yeah, Facebook, or Instagram, or, uh, that's, you can hit me there. And when's your meetup? Uh, so we typically meet last Tuesday of every month, um, in, uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, right now we're meeting at uh, strange ways brewery. Um, I usually have a guest speaker come in, uh, this past month. We had a uh, SEC attorney come in and talk to us about um, funding regulations and that kind of deal, uh, crowdsourcing and then syndication, right? They're kind of, they're a little bit different. Um, so that was super cool. And uh, uh, yeah, so I'm always getting someone else in to try to add some knowledge, right? I, I don't want to be the one always trying to provide the, the knowledge or the insight, right? I bring, bring smart people in for that. So. Yeah, it's good to be a connector. It's usually, it's usually a good time. Exactly. That's awesome. It's good to have it at a brewery too. Uh, there's always yeah. it's fun. Get everyone loosened up a little bit and yep. ready to connect. Cool. Well, Nate, it was great chatting with you. We really appreciate your time um, and we'll, we'll stay in touch. Awesome. Appreciate you all's time. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Real FI podcast, where you learn from the investors that have lived the hard lessons for you. To connect with us during your pursuit of financial independence, be sure to join our community by following us on Instagram or emailing us at info at therealfi.com. If this content made you financially, mentally, physically, or spiritually richer, please make sure to leave us a positive review on your preferred content platform. Cheers to kicking the nine to five.